Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? Well, we got Turkey Day over with, and it's a new, another new day. And this morning, we're going to give thanks for the, a new day to worship, a new day to preach the gospel, a new day to help someone, a new day to, to teach, a new day to learn, a new day to recognize what God is doing in our lives, be it blessing, be it correction, be it chastisement, be it punishment, and address it and respond to it. <clears throat> this is one of the things that um, very few people teach on <clears throat> or share is us responding to the word. I was just listening to a, a sermon this morning and the guy was talking about Joel. And there's other parts that relate back to Joel. And he was referring to one in particular about how God said, I, I'm, I'm not, what else can I do? I'm not going to, and I've shared this one before. I, I'm, I've already struck you. I've already dealt with you and it's not doing anything. What else can I do? I have to relent of this because it's not doing any good. We're the same way. At that, at that point, he was talking about Israel. We're the same way. And so you have to look at yourself and say, okay, am I coming under a chastisement? Yes or no? And you go to the Bible to find out. Then you look at the situation and go, am I responding to the chastisement? I like what he said. He said that a chastisement is when we respond because it's correction. A punishment is when we don't respond. That's when it becomes a punishment. And a lot of us have things going on in our lives and we're not responding to them. Well, then it, become, <clears throat> it becomes a punishment. Chastisement is good. Uh, Diamond covers this all the time. And if you're not being chastised, then you're illegitimate children. We want to have the chastisement. But in addition to that being a blessing, because that's, that we're considered sons of God... We want to respond to what God is doing. He's not doing that for no reason. He's not doing it for the fun of it. He's not just doing it because we're his children. He's doing that because there's something he wants changed. A lot of people today are teaching you you don't have to change. You don't have to change before you get saved. However, you do have to change after you get saved. This has been what's been messing with people, and they hate to hear that. I don't want to have to change. I don't want to give up my life. I don't want to give up what I, what I have. I don't want to give up what I'm doing. I enjoy that. Okay? Then you haven't chosen God. This is where we have to draw a line in the sand and say, Okay, look. If you're willing to accept A, B, C, D, E and re respond to A, B, C, D, E, you can be on this side of the line. If you're not willing to, you automatically, by default, go on the other side of that line. The reason why we're called to this walk is to walk a different path. That means the path that we're walking. That's why repentance must come before belief. That's why we are walking on a particular path and suddenly our mind changes. I don't, I, I don't want to go on this path no more. I want to go on that path. We change our mind. We change our direction. We reconsider our path and we turn to a new one. We go to the Lord Everything changes. A person, anybody can believe. Like James 2 says, anybody can believe. You believe, great, you do well. Demons believe too. Anybody can believe. There are atheists that believe. There are atheists that believe it's all true. They, they openly say, I just don't want any part of it. I've seen, seen many interviews with them. They say, oh yeah, I know it's true. I believe it's true. I just don't want no part of it. Because they have some pride issue or there's something about it that they misunderstand. And so they develop an opinion based on that. Anyone can believe. But do you respond? Has there been a change of heart? Has there been a change of mind? Has there been a change of life? A change of path? Have you been born again? Only born again believers are saved. You must be regenerated. And not enough people are talking about this. They're just telling everyone, oh, just believe and you're fine. No, there's more to it than that. Because if the demons believe and they can't go to heaven and they're condemned already to hellfire, why are we telling people just believe and you'll be fine? That's wrong. This is one of the big problems I have with the grace community and so many others who do videos. 
they just leave it at that. They never explain what's supposed to come after. So it's been put on me to do that in this ministry. To try to get people to understand your life won't be the same after you're, you're truly saved and born again. When you're born again, your desires to watch those action movies goes away. I love action movies. I love superhero movies. I love Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and Sylvester Stallone movies and all that stuff. Love them. I was like a movie fanatic. I was a, I was a movie thesaurus. You could play the first 10 seconds of a movie, the intro music or whatever, or even the, some of the credits, and I could tell you what movie it was. Almost every single time, 100% accurate. My desire now is to not partake in those things. I don't have a desire to watch those movies anymore. In fact, my wife will start up a movie, I just play on the computer. I listen to video, listen to sermons or something. Or I go in the other room. There has to be a change. And not enough people are speaking on this. Not enough people are speaking clearly on this. There has to be a change. Some people, they may not know. Some people, they, they may be scared of offending somebody. I'd rather bully you into heaven than love you into hell. Or bless you into hell. It's just... We're too... We're too easily swayed by other people. And it goes into the Jezebel spirit and other evil spirits and stuff like that. That don't want us to do that. And that's why you have so many people attack you. When I broke out about that Jezebel spirit stuff here, beginning of the year, a bunch of bunch of people right away attacked me. Well, that, that's Jezebel spirit. Because only a Jezebel would be offended by me talking about Jezebel. And so they made it clear where they stood. That happens on a lot of things. If you find a false doctrine and you come out against that false doctrine and you get attacked, you know where that person's heart is. Because if they knew what the truth was, they would stand with you against the against lies. They would stand with you in truth. <clears throat> it's pretty easy to see who's who and where people's hearts are and what they really want out of this. Now, I can't say people are saved or unsaved. But what I can do is tell you what the Bible says. And the Bible says, I, I hear what you're saying. But I don't see the evidence. The Bible says I, I witness what you're doing. But I don't see the faith that's supposed to be associated with it. See, the more I dig into that subject, the more I understand James 2. And this is a hotly contested chapter in the Bible. And people go on and on about it and misunderstand what it says. <clears throat> the more I realize what he's talking about. And it's very clear. The one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to mis in, misinterpret people's intentions, but I also don't want to hold back the truth. Even if it hurts, I don't want to hold it back. Sometimes that medicine is really bitter, but it makes you feel better. Sometimes that medicine is really bitter, but it saves your life. We have to be honest with ourselves and each other. We have to come to terms with these things. We have to address these things openly to ourselves between us and the Lord. It's not between you and me or anyone else. It's between us and the Lord. And we have to talk about these things. If I feel like I'm under chastisement, I go to the Lord. He explains to me what's going on. I respond. Then it ceases to become punishment. It becomes chastisement. And I realize what it's meant to do. And I'm thankful for it. He's treating me as a son. But if I ignore it, or turn it into something else, or start doing all this stuff. I mean, there's just a flood of videos now. Prophetic word from the Lord. Uh, I have a word from the Lord. Uh, here's a prophecy, and they're all like, oh, look how right I am, oh, look how right I am. That's nothing. That's not a prophecy. One guy was touting last night about how um, he made prophecies about Bill Clinton and what was going to happen to him and stuff like that. Look, anybody with inside information knows that. That's not something that's going to help anybody. And even David Coverstone, the, the supposed prophetic dreams he had, people are showcasing that stuff. But are those things important? Or are they, they a distraction from the real truth? Because you watching for the rapture doesn't get you into heaven. You giving out gospel tracts doesn't get you into heaven. You preaching the gospel doesn't get you into heaven. 
None of that gets you into heaven. You having faith in Jesus Christ and being born again in his likeness, that gets you access to heaven. You having the blood and paying for your sins, that gets you into heaven. Being a son of God, that gets you into heaven. And far too many Christians don't understand what that means. Far too many Christians are pulling their punches when they give this truth out because they're, they're fearful that they're going to hurt someone's feelings. We need to hurt those people's feelings so they will turn. Because everybody else has been patting them on the back going, do you believe? Yep, you're going to heaven. See you up there. No, you won't. Because far too many of those people aren't saved. Because they think, oh yeah, I believe Jesus is, is real. That's it? Oh yeah, I know he was real. I, I, I believe that he died on the cross. And that's it? That, that's all you got? I believe Jesus is real. See, the demons believe he's real too. When he died on the cross, almost all the demons in the world were there present. They were in the spiritual realm watching it. They know. I believe Jesus is real. I believe he died on the cross. But I believe Jesus Christ, and I'm talking from Sean's perspective. I believe Jesus Christ is the savior of the entire world. I believe Jesus died for my sins, to pay my sin debt so that I could be a son of God and enter into heaven. I believe he is active in my life every minute of every day. I believe God the Father is in everything, working everything for my betterment. I believe that I'm being chastised and trained and taught and, and re reconstituted. I believe that I am born again in him. He is my savior. He's my brother. He's my king. He's my Lord. We're co-heirs together for the kingdom. My father in heaven is my creator. He's my father. I worship him. My belief and my faith and what I believe is so much more extensive than so many other people I talk to because they give such a basic answer. It's like, do you really believe? Or are you just repeating what someone else said? I don't say these things to put people into doubt. I say these things to get people to think, to get people to stop and go, let me go to the Lord and talk to him about this and find out because I want to know. Don't, don't think you know. No. Do you know you're saved and going to heaven? Do you know you're a child of God? Now, are you going to have doubt sometimes? Yes. Satan's always trying to get you to doubt. That's normal. But do you know that through Jesus Christ, you are going to heaven? Do you know the details behind it? Do you have an extensive understanding of it? That's true belief. Because there was no person in the Bible that ever said, sure, I believe you're real. And that was it. You go read. It, it's it's kind of hidden in there, but if you go read, they give very descriptive responses to those kinds of questions. They knew what they were doing. They knew. They, they understood that my path now is different. I'm not walking towards the world and what the world is doing. I'm walking towards God and what he's doing. They knew something was different. They knew something was changed. And their life showed the evidence of that change. There was never a person in the Bible who ever came in close proximity to God and did not change everything. There was never a person in the Bible who did not change, who showed no evidence of change. There has to be some there. Something has to happen. And we, we fail all of our brethren when we don't address these things clearly like adults. When we don't take our Christian authority and tell them, okay, you say you believe. Great. But what do you believe? Have you ever asked yourself that question? What do you believe in? Who do you believe in? What do you believe about that person? And is your knowledge and understanding on those subjects growing? That's growing in grace. That's growing in Christ. We've got far too carnal of an understanding about this stuff. We really have got to be open and honest with people so that they understand the truth behind this. So that they can grow in truth and grow in grace and grow in love. I'm on this journey too. But the one thing that I don't want to do, and I, it's what I see so many others doing, is avoiding those subjects. We must talk about them. If it's in the Bible, we have to talk about it. And we 
we don't, we do a disservice to each other. Because to the believer, this is uh, the true believer. This is exhortation. This is this is edification. But to the false convert, it's conviction. Hopefully, to repentance. To the the uh, unrepentant or the the unregenerate, this foolishness. It's a pretty clear indicator as to who's born again and who isn't. Because when you talk of such things, they're either going to attack you or they're going to go learn more. That's a big indicator of who's really born again. If I give something out and that person takes it and runs with it and goes and learns more and grows, that's a born again individual. They want more God. They want more Jesus Christ. If I get attacked or the message gets attacked and that person goes, and I, I like this part of my life. I don't want to give it up. I got to wonder. It's not for me to judge, but I got to wonder. Luckily, he is the judge. And he will judge all of us. And he will judge our hearts because he knows our true intentions. I want to be judged by him. This is another hallmark of a true born-again believer. I want to be judged by you, God. I want to be judged by you, Lord. Because I know your judgment is true. Whether I'm right or wrong, whether it comes out good or bad for me, I know your judgment is true. I trust that. That's true faith and trust in Christ. But what do we have running around today? A lot of people trying to avoid the judgment discussion. It's coming. We're all going to be there. Let's walk in faith and unity. This morning we're going to pray Psalm 16, the hope of the faithful and the Messiah's victory, a victim of David. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, to lift up your holy name on high, to sing praises to your name. Riches and the kingdom are yours. All things belong to you and all things fall under your dominion. Father, we wish to be judged by you because we know your judgment is true. We know your judgment is right. The world can't judge us correctly. No one else can judge you. We give thanks this day for this day. And we give thanks for the wonderful peace and, and the day we had yesterday. And every day before that and every day after this. The peace that you're giving into our lives. The peace that you've created. The, the leading and the prompting and leading us through the word. I know we don't get it right, but I pray that we will respond to what you're doing in our lives. We will act on what you're trying to accomplish in us. Because it's nothing but blessings if we do. It's all good. Nothing bad. I pray we don't deny it and we don't turn from it. We don't ignore it which sadly most people seem to be doing today. Father, I pray for them and I ask you to bless them with an open heart, to, an open eyes, an open ears, an open mind to see and receive these things and to understand them and to act from a place of wisdom and respond from wisdom. Father, thank you for the rain that you're about to bring today. We desperately need it. It's awesome rain coming. Thank you for the everything you provide for us. Thank you for this word and for our Lord Jesus to die for us. For the, Thank you for the blood. Thank you for um, putting in us an understanding of these things at this time when all the world is trying to get us to believe something else. Father, have mercy on your children. Have mercy on your people, Israel. Many of us are, the world has got us in its tentacles and we are fighting to get out. Some of us are making it. Many of us are giving up. Father, give us strength to continue. Give us strength to pull our way up out of that and reach your hand down and grab a hold of our hand that we may get out of that mess and come into your light and stand on your path and walk towards you. Now's the time when all men need to turn to you and repent need to be aware of what they're doing. Be aware of what you're trying to do. Or I take that back, what you're doing. And be respondent to it. See it for what it is and walk to it. Address it. Stand in it. 
It's a hard thing to be faithful in this day, day and age. But you have taken many of us out of the situation and put us in very, very quiet situations. You've removed me from every stressful situation I have, which is awesome. It's involved me walking away from several family members and a whole lot of friends. But I'm going to trust in you. Because I know it'll work out for my betterment and I'm hoping it'll work out for their betterment. I want nothing but good things for everyone around me. And Father, you I trust for that. You I trust for my wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I've prayed for you several times for that. You I trust for your word. I trust your word. It's you I trust for everything. I can't trust anyone else. But I can trust you. I can rely on you. Father, thank you for that trust. Thank you for everything. Thank you a thousand times for all that you are doing. May you be praised with every voice. May every heart worship you and cry out to you and sing to you. May we all be found watching. May we all, may we all be found when Jesus comes doing exactly what tasks he gave us to do. May we be ready and prepared and worthy to stand before you. We're not perfect. And we're never going to be until you make us perfect. But you told us what to do in the word. And I pray that we do that. This morning I'd like to pray Psalm 16. The hope of the faithful and the Messiah's victory. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrow shall be multiplied, who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. <clears throat> the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Father, I look forward to standing at your right hand. Of all the things that are promised in your word, my desire is to have a place at your right hand. With my brethren, that we may worship you forever. I can think of nothing better. Because I know that with you I'm safe. With you, I have nothing to worry about. We love you, Father, and we thank you for your great mercy and grace and for this great gift of salvation you have given us and for this wonderful word and for our Lord Jesus Christ who has died for us. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me for morning prayer. Think about these things. It, it, they're not bad. This is the misconception that people have got, come under. These things aren't bad. He's not going to be mad at you if you come to him and say, Lord, why did you pick me? What was it about me you wanted? Lord, why do I keep making these mistakes? Why, do, why am I messing up? Lord, am I in, in your good graces? Am I going to heaven? Am I saved? In any of a thousand other questions like that, he's not going to be mad if you ask them. He wants you to know the truth. But he also wants you to come to him to look for it. And when you do, with a sincere heart, he will pour that understanding out like you will not believe. And you will be blessed beyond measure. And then you will know. And you will trust and you will be at peace. And you won't have to worry about, am I saved? And, you know, what's waiting for me? Am I going to make it? He's going to take care of that. It's all about us trusting in him 
and having faith in him and in what he's doing. With that, we've got nothing to worry about. I love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I pray you have a beautiful day, and I will see you guys in the next video.